Eftar och sånt. Jag är Beirut Kamali Tabrizi. Jag är direktör av Shabin och Musavar. Bijan Musavar Rahmani Center för Iran och Fashion Golf Studies. So many times repeating this. You mix it up. And today is my great pleasure to introduce to you our speaker, Professor Abu Najafian who is an assistant professor of Islamic studies at McAllister College. Uh, she's coming from uh, Minnesota, and this is midsummer for her, <laughs> from Minnesota to <laughs> Princeton. Um, she uh, specializes in uh, Persian uh, Islam and studies the relationship between religion and literature in contemporary Iran. She is currently working on a book project entitled Poetic Nation, Iranian Soul and Historical Continuity, um, which was the topic of her dissertation as well. About the intersection of religion, poetry, and politics in the 20th century Iran through the poetry of the famed 14th century poet Hafez. Another project made possible through the an NEH grant for scholarly editions and translations is a collaborative translation of Farid Din and Atal, Musibat Name, uh, what we need these days, oh, yes, uh, yes, <laughs> which, <laughs> which is translated uh, as uh, the divine tragedy. Um, through the translation, we expl uh, ex she explores Atar's engagement with language and reflect on the use of allegory. Uh, born and raised in Tehran, Najafian earned a uh, BA and MA in English Literature from Tehran University, uh, an MA in Women and Gender Studies at the University of British Columbia, some Canadian connection. Uh, and uh, she received her doctorate in Religious Studies uh, from Stanford University. Thank you so much all um, for uh, joining us today and please welcome. Thank you so much Professor Dalai Tafrizi and Iranian Studies and everyone for coming. And please feel free to eat. I don't know how many of you have seen or remember the movie Max. Says, <laughs> I'm more comfortable if you eat while I'm playing. So that's the case with me too. Uh, so as a Professor Ramey Tabizi mentioned, I'm working on my book based on the dissertation, and this is one chapter of the book. But I thought it would be a good idea to give you a brief background, how I came up with this topic, what it is, and where I'm hoping to uh, go with it. So I, um, again, as the title uh, mentions, uh, it seems that we are dealing with some eternal concepts, poetic nation, Iranian soul, historical continuity. So if I could, there would be a quotation mark around all of them. Uh, so the idea was that how did the Iranian intelligentsia try to build a modern citizenship, but also with that continuity from the past. And I'm very much interested in form and content. And of course, when it comes to poetry in the 20th century, everybody is overshadowed by new poetry. Nima, Shandu, Farouk. And we do not work on poets who write in classical genres. So uh, me being me, I thought, OK, I'm going to work on things that nobody likes. So uh, what does Ghazal do? in 20th century, and part of the question was that, again, looking at this continuity and change uh, from, uh, okay, I'll explain from when, because, yeah, it's, if I want to explain, I start 10,000 years ago, this was the case, <laughs> 9,000 years ago, and I, I won't do that. Uh, but the idea was that there was always this eternal nation, this identity as an Iranian, and in 20th century, a lot of it was, starting in 19th century, a lot of it was based on uh, poetry and Hafez. And I'm sure many of you have heard that it is the Persian language that has created this uh, nationality, this Iranian nationality and poetry is that which 
uh, connects all Iranians to the present, past, and uh, future. But mainly I was interested in the idea of Irfan, which is roughly translated as Iranian mysticism, Iranian Sufism, sometimes just mysticism. I have issues with translating the term myself. Uh, I'd be more than happy to talk about the translation issues uh, later. So I wanted to know what happens to Erfan in 20th century in Iran. And uh, what is poetry doing in connection to religion? Again, because with the rise of nationalism, many people are looking for a secular model of nationalism. And for some, uh, poetry becomes the new religion. And, and again, it is not just an Iranian thing. We know Matthew Arnold proposed that, that we can find our ethics in literature. And again, this idea of national literatures is something that is happening. Edward Brown writes a national history of Iran based on the uh, poetry. So as I said, at first, I wanted to focus on Ghazal in the 20th century. And when it comes to Ghazal in the Persian sphere, ooh, and I would love to know what the Princeton community thinks about the term Persian, it's again something he'll talk about later. Uh, we encounter certain conventional understandings, two of which uh, interest me here. One, Ghazal is the genre for expressing the mystical, and two, Ghazal is not a suitable form to express the concerns of modern man. And I'm borrowing it from Nemo, says, we are facing new issues and the classical genres are too limiting for us to express what we need. So we need a new language and uh, that also goes back to the idea during the constitutional revolution that it is the poetical tyranny that is causing, po uh, it is poetical tyranny that is causing political tyranny because with classical genres, we are limited by form. And again, it's in that sense that I refer to Iran as a poetic nation. It seems that the modern understandings connected to poetry and to the point that it is connected to political systems. Better. <laughs> <laughs> and so I started looking into Ghazal, but the more I worked, I realized people talk about Hafez and Irfan. When they want to talk about Irfan in contemporary Iran, they jump to Hafez, nobody else. And also I found something very interesting and I was thinking, should I share it with you? Should I not? I will. But about the idea of Ghazal as a form. As I said, Nima was one of the people, Nima Yushish, the father of new poetry, uh, who believed we do not need Ghazal. It's dated. We cannot express anything meaningful. You're just repeating the conventional imagery. But in, uh, after the coup, this old gentleman uh, by the name of uh, Kazam Akhavaz Zanjani came into picture, he's saying with Nima here, here he is, who wrote Ghazals. And it is said that the Ghazals were so expressive of the Iranian soul that Nima cried. I don't believe Nima cried, but yeah. again. It is said that Nima has said, and again, I don't think he said it, but the fact that it is in the story, Nima said, if someone can write Ghazals like this, then we do not need new poetry. Again, I don't think Nima said that, but the fact that the story goes like that, again, false histories amuse me more than actual histories. Why we come up with these things, and the rest of the talk is about that as well. So everyone was praising him, Except one critic kept saying, these poems are very, sound very familiar to me. And the other said, no, you're just jealous. <laughs> Until one day, a PhD student was digging in the Indian section uh, books of a library in Mashhad University. And he came up with a volume of Hazin al Ghazals. So a 17th century poet, born under the Safavi, moved to India and produced poetry in India. The only thing the gentleman had done was change Hazin's <laughs> pen name to Qafas. But again, the fact that this 17th century poet who was writing in India could represent something that sounded like modern Ghazal 
itself is a fascinating story for me. And I'm going to do more work on that. But again, does it go to the Ghazal as genre that it deals with universal things? That's why we're still reading Hafez or Rumi or something else is happening. So have this at a background. But again, this was the most intriguing non hafez uh, related. Although, no, Hafez plays a role in this thing too. Okay, I'm going to tell you the whole story. I'll cut Mr. Mutahari uh, if, if needs be. Uh, when he was confronted by the critics, said, why did you do that? And said, well, one night Hazina Lahiji came to my sleep, to my dream, and told me I was more famous than Hafez when I was alive, and people have forgotten me. Please make my poems read again. And uh, Mr. Babos himself says, I was going to tell everyone before my death. <laughs> <laughs> but again, the idea that the poetic memory, how is it that Hazina Lahiji is forgotten to the point that someone can plagiarize his poetry and Hafez is not? What is happening? What goes into the making of the canon? My post-tenure project, and I learned from Professor Kamai Tavis, it will be my retirement project, <laughs> is studying what happens to the Indian style. Because I think most of you who have gone to school in Iran, we study from the beginning, we read Jami, jump to the return, literary return in so 18th century. So what is happening with the Indian style? Why are they not as present as Khurasani, Araqi, and the, the return. So, uh, and again, as I said, my questions were, how do people express their fun in 20th century? What is Ghazal doing in 20th century? So, most experts agree that Erfan is a syncretism of Shi'ism and Sufism, but they disagree on its origin. There are two dominant theories about the origins of Erfan. The first views it as a 20th century adaptation and that synthesizes Sufi thought and Shi'i philosophy in order to offer a rational and universal concept compatible with, if not identical to, mysticism. So part of my research deals with this idea of mysticism as well. And that's why I try to refer to the concept as Erfan rather than mysticism. And I show how understandings of mysticism have had an effect on how we understand Erfan today or how it was understood in the 20th century. So mysticism in its global uh, understandings and one very, very ambitious thing that I want to do is because in religious studies we're dealing mostly with Christian concept. Mysticism itself is a Christian concept. If we introduce a concept like Erfan, can we also make that a universalist concept? Can we use Erfan to look at Buddhism? And if the answer is no, my question is why do we use mysticism to look at Buddhism? if it is just a Christian concept. So again, this is the ambitious part I probably won't be able to do, but I'm dreaming. The second theory of Erfan is a, a philosophical, uh, according to the second theory, Erfan is a philosophical development, the roots of which should be sought in the establishment of the Safavid dynasty in Iran and declaration of Shism as the official religion of the new empire. While the former considers the creation process in part as a reaction to pangs of being left behind in the modernization process, the proponents of the latter theory emphasize the long history of the concept and its consolidation by Shi scholars who created it based on concepts already available in Islamic thought. But the development of ideas is not an either or process. An encounter does not necessarily translate into reaction on part of the dominated party. Uh, here are the modern Iranian thinkers who were receiving these ideas. So William James's, uh, uh, what's the name of his book? Now I'm remembering the mistranslation that Mr. Motahari gives, he gives psyche and religion. Uh, but religious something, something, and mystical experience is part of that. Hmm? Exploration and mystical, no, not mystical, religious experience, something. So he's being translated. And again, the mysticism that he talks about 
is understood that, oh, this is exactly like Erfan that we have. So uh, the same is true about the temporal direction, whether creating the concept as a distinct category in Shi'i thought independent of and superior to Tasavvuf Sufism in the 17th century or developing it as an eternal Iranian form of spirituality that could be shared with humanity in the 20th century, independent of religious orientation, the scholars read their presence into their past. Erfan is a constantly shifting social and historical construct that appears in different forms in multiple genres in the Islamic field. The scholarship on the subject in the past 50 years, especially after the 1979 Iranian revolution, has highlighted and insisted on the animosity between the ulama and the Sufis. And so this is one of the things we see in certain studies of uh, Islam and Sufism, that the scholastic religiosity is against this free mystical idea. The reason is somewhat zealous effort to dissociate the exoteric and esoteric in the modern study of religion. Another dimension is added to the development of the concept of Irfan after modernity, which seeks to offer a non-religious spirituality that distances itself both from the per uh, perceived sectarian prejudices of Shi clergy and the alleged plebeian irrationality of the Sufis. As such, my contention is that from the mid 19th century onward, poetry starts to play a far more important role in popularizing Erfan among the lay people as well as the intellectual inquiry of scholars on the concept. And uh, Atta Anzali, who I learned will be visiting next year, has done a great job in framing the history of mysticism from Safavi to. Uh, 19th uh, century. But when it comes to 19th, 20th century, amongst the secular uh, intelligentsia, the idea is that it is spirituality. And I'm, I mean, I always ask my students, uh, what's your ideas about religion? And almost 99% say, I'm spiritual, but not religious. So again, this is that modern understanding that we have some sort of spirituality, but we're not religious, and Irfan plays that role for many of these uh, people. So for example, uh, Abdul Hussein Azad in Kub, in Iranian Sufism in its historical perspective, Tasavvuf Irani Darman Zad Tarihi on, and again, it's interesting that he's using the term Tasavvuf and not Irfan, I'll come to it. Juxtaposes Iranian Sufism with those found in India, Turkey, and North Africa, claiming that the reason behind the unpopularity of Sufi orders in Iran compared to the other regions is Iranians' inherent opposition to organized religiosity and quickly adds that anti-establishment Sufism was kept alive since the time of Mansur Hallaj, the 10th century mystic who claimed, I am God, I am the real, and al haq um, In Persian literature, and its effects are present in Persian Ghazals to this day. Mm -hmm. Again, it doesn't say that it was the Safavid who made most of the Sunni Sufis leave Iran, move to India. Uh, so it's, no, it's the inherent Iranian resistance to this irrational, superstitious thing. Therefore, he concludes, Sufi orders had no special role in developing and propagating Sufism in Iran, and it was Persian literature that mirrored Sufi tendencies. As such, poetry became a prom prominent analytical category in the study of Erfan, and certain classical poets became synonymous with the essence of Erfan, among whom Hafez is the most intriguing for me. So we all know about Rumi. Ironically, Khayyam has been associated with Irfan, which again, can an atheist be an RF? The, their answer is yes, absolutely. Which again goes back, was Khayyam an atheist or not? I'm not going to get, go into that rabbit hole. Uh, I'll try to stick to this one. And the more I started pri uh, primary sources, as I said, uh, the more I was convinced that almost every thinker in the 20th century who talks about Irfan refers to Hafez to define it. Not that they have a definition of Irfan. They look at Hafez and say, okay, this is Irfan. 
take, for example, uh, Ehsan Yar Shatter's explanation of the term Arif, so the subject form of Erfan, the mystic. Hafez very often is called an Arif. It doesn't say by whom, but we know by everyone. Even Jami writes that although he didn't belong to any Sufi order, he is very well known, well loved amongst them. That's why they call him the son of Ayy, the tongue of the unseen, the language of the unseen. Hafez very often is called an Arif. The application of this term depends on what is meant by it. If by Arif is meant a person of wisdom and insight, broad mindedness and understanding, given to reflection on human destiny, the transience of life, and the vanity of our worldly concerns, a man who would not go after dogmatic rigidity of formal religion and the intervention of self-appointed guardians of faith in the daily lives of believers, but would prefer the devotion of truly pious men and sets high value on purity of heart and ordinances, in other words, a benevolent sage, there is no reason to deny that epithet to Hafez. So again, not much about religion, if anything, against institutional religion. He continues, on the other hand, if by Arif is meant a mystic, and he uses mystic, and it's, it's in English, I have not translated it. You know my translations, they're terrible. I work on bad poetry, so I stick to bad translation. Too. <laughs> if uh, by Arif is meant a mystic, that is a person who believes in the theory and practice of Sufism, is attached to a certain order, or the circle of a Sufi mentor, Pir, or Khanga, or allows the clarity of his mind to be clouded by the irrational and obfuscated by the woolly thinking of some Sufis and their belief in miraculous deeds ascribed to their saints, then the epithet is a misnomer. While it is clear that Hafez distinguishes sincere self-effacing and godly mystics from the false ones, he does not belong to any Sufi school of thought but chooses to be entirely free and independent of any such attachment. So again, see, independence of thought, not following a leader. On the other hand, we have Shia clergy like Ayatollahs, Taba Tabai, Khomeini, and Mutahari, who consider Hafez to be a true Arif precisely because he is a true Shia. I will come back to this. Why? That the reason that he's an Arif is that he's a Shia. So it seems that we're dealing with two opposing ideas about Irfan based on Hafez. On the one hand, Irfan is articulated as an alternative mode of spirituality that can express modern aspirations that include individualistic quests through undermining the social networks of Sufism and universalistic due to its rootedness in human thought which explains Hafez's popularity to this day. So that's what they're saying. And remember, at this point, we are reading the classical poets in a political uh, light, too. Hafez is a socialist. Hafez is a revolutionary. That's how Sham Lu is reading him. Um, and on the other hand, we have the Shi religious scholars who share with the spiritualist camp the anti-institutionalized Sufism sentiment but trace the concept back to pietistic Islamic uh, root. So in my book, I study Abdul Hussein Hajir, who is coming from an Aryan chauvinist uh, point of view, compares Hafiz to Tagore as Aryan poets. Uh, I have Ahmad Kasravi, who hates Hafiz and Sufism and Shiism and Baha'ism, all this. Uh, and he hates Hafiz the most because uh, he's a great poet, so he had book burning sessions every year, and Hafez was the most popular to burn. Uh, I have Ahmad Shamlu, Ruhullah Khomeini, Murtaza Mutahari, and Hushang Ibtad Hajj, all of whom engage with Hafez. So what's happening that all these people from different walks of political life are imitating Hafez. And there is another tension that informs my project, namely that between the good Islam and bad Islam in popular and sometimes academic understandings of Islam. Bad Islam is the political Islam of the Iranian government, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, the Taliban. And good Islam is open-mindedness of Sufism and intellection of mysticism, the spirituality of Rumi and cosmopolitan poetry. But the binary easily crumbles if we look a bit closer. For example, what to do with the love poetry of the Taliban or the mystical poetry of Ayatollah Khomeini. 
And going back to the issue of form, are they just imitating the conventions of the genre without actually meaning it? Um, I do this to my students. I give them poetry of Taliban without telling them it's the poetry of Taliban. They love it. And then when I tell them it's Taliban, they don't know what to do with it. But that's, that's the type of teacher I am. So how did we end up with these two paradigms of Irfan? As I mentioned, Atta and Zali studies the development of the term uh, uh, with the rise of the Safavids and desonification of Iran, which involved reimagining Hasavuf in the form and language of Irfan. And it does a great job showing how in 19th century, uh, some Shi'i Sufis start uh, using Tasavvuf and Irfan interchangeably. So destigmatizing Tasavvuf slowly. And today in Iran, usually they are used the same, uh, interchangeably, unless people have other agenda. But anyway. And I want to dig deeper in the more secular understanding of uh, Erfan and study it, as I mentioned, within the larger global discourse on mysticism after modernity with a focus on poetic uh, discourse. So part of my current research is to studying the traveling idea of Erfan uh, from Iran to Europe to New England, then again back to Iran. And we are familiar with figures uh, like Goethe, Nietzsche, he actually has a poem uh, called From a Teetotaler, did I pronounce it correctly, to a wine drinker. Um, Fitzgerald and Emerson, and Emerson we know had the German translations of Hafez and Sadi and how he's engaging with them. What is ignored is the role of Shiza. Again, with his secular understanding, Shiza is put aside. I will just give you two examples before moving to the actual uh, talk. Sorry, I needed 30 minutes of uh, foregrounding. But again, and this is the part that I now I'm doing more research on. First example, in his influential 1883 lecture, Islam and Science, delivered at the Sorbonne, the Orientalist Ernest Renan makes the following claim about the young Muslim child. From the beginning of his religious initiation at the age of 10 or 12 until then, uh, still quite aware, suddenly the child becomes fanatical, full of a foolish pride in possessing what he believes is the absolute truth, happy with what determines his inferiority, as if it were a privilege. This senseless pride in the radical vice of the Muslim. The apparent simplicity of his worship inspires him with a contempt for other religions that has little justification. Convinced that God determines wealth and power to whomever he sees fit, regardless of education or personal merit, the Muslim has the deepest contempt for education, for science, for all, the con for all that constitutes the European spirit. So our friend is a bit Islamophobe, huh? This bent instilled by the Muslim faith is so strong that all differences of race and nationality disappear by the act of converting to Islam. The Berber, the Sudanese, the Afghani, the Malaysian, the Egyptian, the Nubian, once they become Muslim, are no longer Berber, Sudanese, Egyptians, etc. These are Muslims. But Persia alone is an exception <laughs> because we are Aryans. It has kept its genius because Persia was able to assume a separate place in Islam. It is basically more Shiite than Muslim. <laughs> so separating the concept of Shiism from Muslim. My other example comes from the entry on Hafez in the 1902 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica by the Orientalist uh, Edward Herm Henry Palmer, who had earlier published a volume called Oriental Mystics by Persian uh, Poets and dedicated to Napoleon III for some reason. <laughs> Uh, but in the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, he states that Hafez, quote, like most Persian, was a Shia by religion. Again, the Persianness becomes associated with Shiza. And defines the creed as a belief, quote, in the transmission of the office of Imam, or head of the Muslim church, in the family of Ali, cousin of the Prophet, and rejecting the hadith, or traditional sayings of Mahomet, which uh, formed the sunnah, or supplementary code of Mahometan ceremonial law. So he doesn't even use the term Islam, not Mohammedanism, Mahometan, the Turkish term. And I 
I'm trying to figure out where he's getting this understanding of Shiza. So this is the part that I don't know. If anyone knows, please do tell me. Um, but it seems that he's describing the Qullat rather than mainstream Shiza. But the claims are interesting in their inaccuracy and considering Hafez to be a Shia due to his Persianness is quite pertinent to uh, my study. So with this background, let's now turn to the mystical politics of the revolutionary Iran. And in the remainder of the talk, I will discuss the views of modernist poet Ahmad Shamlu and Erfan and Hafez and the responses they drew uh, from Ayatollah Murtaza Mutahari. A background about the two. Uh, Murtaza Mutahari was one of the most influential theorists of the 1979 revolution in Iran. And I learned about him more today from Professor Nawai Tabrizi, so thank you. Uh, he pursued his religious education in the Qom Seminary, where he was deeply influenced uh, by the lessons in Akhlaq and Irfan taught by at Ayatollah Ruhullah Khomeini. He began teaching in the theology department at Tehran University in 1954, where he attracted many students involved in social and political movements. In 1969, he helped to found Hussein Yeh Irshad uh, with Ali Shariati an independent cultural center that focused on religious and social issues of the day. His works institu uh, include institutions of women's right in Islam, the perfect human, commentary on the principle of philosophy and the method of realism, uh, spiritual freedom, mutual services of Islam in Iran, and a critique of Marxism. Motahari exerted significant influence unless that's a myth, on school and university students and instructors uh, acting as an inspiration for the figure of a committed and socially aware Muslim who could make an intellectually appropriate and exciting response to modern secularizing tendencies. Uh, he was one of the closest advisors uh, of Ayatollah Khomeini, which again I learned they didn't listen to him most of the times, or sometimes. Uh, and founded the Revolutionary Council at his behest as, uh, at the onset of the 1979 revolution. He was assassinated by a member of uh, Forban, an anti-clerical Shia group, uh, after a meeting of the Revolutionary Council. Uh, Ahmad Shamlu is perhaps one of the most influential modernist poets of Iran after Nimoy Yushij, the father of new Persian poetry. He never finished high school and began his poetic career in 1947 by publishing his first collection of poems, uh, Forgotten Songs, uh, written in both classical and new or Nimaic, uh, Nimaic forms. Uh, he didn't let it to be published again and <laughs> apparently destroyed everything that was there. They didn't like it. Uh, he contributed to literary journals where he argued for the necessity of the poet's commitment to society and acting as the conscience of the nation. After the 1953 coup, he was arrested and was sentenced to 14 months in prison. And he published his modernist poems in blank verse in Fresh Air, in 1957, which established him as a serious poet among his peers. It has been said about the collection Quote, anyone who reads Fresh Air can see that this language, this texture, is different from anything else. Fresh Air is the greatest event in our poetry after Hafez. So again, even wanting to praise a poet, it is after Hafez. So it's by Mubahid. He acted as the editor-in-chief of many literary journals of Iran in 1960s and 70s, which again acted as an influential intellectual force against the politics of the Pahlavi monarchy. He faced censorship after the revolution and uh, focused more on his lifelong project, Kitab Kuche, uh, street talk perhaps, an encyclopedia of slang Persian idioms and expression, and he tried to write poetry in that genre too, but said it was too limiting. Um, he passed away on July 23, 2000, and was buried in a small cemetery outside of Tehran, which has become a mausoleum for his devotees. Uh, Shamu started working on the Divan of Hafez in 1968 and published Hafez according to Ahmad Shamlu in 1974. Uh, and it's been criticized by almost all critics. He has his own very special reading of Hafez. 
In his framing, Hafez is a revolutionary who rises against the authority figures of his time through poetry. In his preface to the edition, Sean Lu asked, who is this blasphemous vagrant who single-handedly denies the day of resurrection and celebrates wine against the cruel, pious rulers of his time? Yet his divan is found in every shelf in every Iranian home next to the Quran. For Shamlu, Erfan is just a recourse for Hafez to escape from rigid religiosity and to cloak his social critic, uh, social critique. Sorry, my Persian accent is coming out, so bear with me. Um, to cloak his social critique in mystical language. Shamlu portrays the poet as an atheist who is merely using, quote, the common beliefs of his deluded time to pretend he is content to share with others the suffocating cage of the world. Uh, Shamlu maintains that Hafez's epistemological tools could not have been beyond the superstitious worldview of his age. Quote, he is a natural born vagrant in an abysmal darkness without a ray of sunshine in his horizon. Not even a flicker becomes the guiding threat for his thought. The possibility of imagining the world based on material laws for someone who is looking for an answer to the riddle of existence with metaphysical language and terms is as possible as a blind man imagining light and sunshine when no one has told him about light and sunshine and of that amazing feeling of seeing. He can neither have an image of it nor have a name for that image. So saying he was limited by his vocabulary and concepts. So that's why he wasn't as successful or why he was using the religious language. Hafiz, according to Shamlu, does not hope to find a new truth, but strive to reach the same truth otherwise. His only recourse is to show that what the possessors of power offer as the path to truth is wrong but the end for him is similar to those he is resisting. Sean Lu is of the opinion that the reason behind unrivaled popularity of Hafez in such an externalist society like Iran, Peshri, throughout history is his hedonistic philosophy, which socially speaking has walked hand in hand with Erfan. Sean Lu goes one step further, claiming that the poet is standing before the same inscription before which Dante once stood at the gates of Inferno, abandon all hope you enter here. But instead, he is at the very gates of existence itself. Struck by the disaster of present, he struggles to reveal its ugly truth, to unveil the hypocrisy of authority figures whose prosperity lies in keeping the people in the dark. The modern poet abruptly turns to the issue of incoherence and contradictions of different copies and editions of the divans. And this is an issue that has concerned many people. So there are several editions of the divan, and some poems are different. We have some poems in certain ones. We don't have any in the others. There is this fascinating one by uh, Ahmad Shahid Darabi called Latifei Qaybi that says Hafez was a Shia. This is a late 18th, early 19th century text that proves Hafez was a Shia. And I haven't been able to find those poems in any editions that I uh, looked at. Um, and we're talking about Orientalists, so I want to tell you what Edward Brown uh, says about the outrageous inconsistencies of the poem. I love it because it goes back to that eternal essentialist understanding of nationality. Uh, the Persian character, that's how he justifies it. Anyone who understands the psychology of the people of Persia, Brown informs the reader, knows that it is common enough to meet persons who in the course of a single day will alternately present themselves as pious Muslims, heedless libertines, confirmed skeptics and mystical pantheists, or even incarnation of the deity. And again, it's interesting, he is borrowing his account of Hafez from Shebli Nomani, and it's verbatim the same except this part. Shebli Nomani says, Ghazal represents life, and life is filled with contradictions. That's why, and, and I really, really like this explanation myself. Back to Shambhu. Uh, here are his reasons for the inconsistencies in Hafez. 
Uh, it proposes that most people say it is because of the evolution of a poet from a religious youth to a rebellious elder. Uh, he rejects this idea and says the reason behind the dispersed Iban and chaotic Tazals, which have resulted in numerous and often contradictory editions, is that what we have as the Divan of Hafez is not the whole work of the poet. Referring to the entry on Hafez in Arafat al Ashraqin wa Arasat al Arafin by Taqiyuddin Ohadi al Taqiyuddin al Baliani, 17th century uh, biographer, Shandu asserts, what is cer certain is that most subversive poems as well as his later works have definitely been destroyed one way or another. So I had to check out this Dabiri account. Um, and in Dabiri's account, Hafez becomes the target of attacks from a famous sheikh for constantly making fun of him in his ghazal, one in particular, O oh, graceful partridge, walking so pleasantly, be not proud because the ascetic cat, or the ascetic cat, has said its uh, prayer. Uh, and again, in Persian, it can be both the cat that belongs to the ascetic or the cat who is an ascetic uh, himself. Dariye uh, Valiani continues, some say it was a mod faqih, but others attributed to Sheikh Ali Kola, who, who had a cat that would stand behind him and genuflect when he was saying his praise, uh, prayers. The enmity escalated and the Sheikh accused Hafez of blasphemy, heresy, and disbelief based on one verse, and it was decided that a hearing was arranged before Shah Shuja in order to prove the accusation. Khaja was quite anxious about the hearing. So by the recommendation, he composed another line and added it before the controversial line and was freed from the distress because what was attributed to him was now the claim of a Christian. In some, after the hearing before that just prince, because of the guidance of that perfect peer, no harm fell on him and he left the court safe and sound. However, while the hearing was in progress, the women of his household tore all his writings and washed them away, fearing that a great harm would befall him because of those. Yet friendship of the fool cannot fare any better. Khaja was so affected by this event that he joined his maker shortly. Thereafter, his enemies were ashamed of what they had done and all sought after his poems, including that prince who rewarded each ghazal with a 200 dinar gold coin. Therefore, his poems were published and recited everywhere, and his fame reached where it reached. And because people were searching for his poems, many a poem by others were also attributed to him. Uh, as I said, uh, Shebli Nomani and Edward Brown uh, say slightly different story. The sheikh in question is Ahmad Faqi, who was the favorite poet of the prince Shah Shuja. It was said that he had taught his cat to follow him in his genuflection when he performed his prayers. Uh, this uh, achievement, according to the prince, almost a miracle. But Hafez considered his trick and ridiculed the sheikh in uh, the Ghazal beginning with the Sufi displayed his virtues and began his coquetry. He began scheming with the sorcering heavens. Mentioning the cat in the eighth line, O oh, graceful partridge, walking so pleasantly, be not proud, because the ascetic cat has just said its prayers. Brown rejects the idea that the poet's ridicule of the sheikh had anything to do with the accusation of blasphemy, but rather poetic rivalry on behalf of the prince, Shah Shuja. The prince himself was uh, his not very successful rival in the field of poetry, and jealousy appears to have increased that dislike. On one occasion, the prince criticized Hafez's verse on the ground of its many-sided aspects, so <laughs> this repetition of the polysemy and contradiction in Hafez. No one motive, he complained, inspired it. It was at one moment mystical, at another erotic and mechanical, now serious and spiritual, and again flippant and worldly or worse. True, replied Hafez. But in spite of all this, everyone knows, admires, and repeats my verses, while the verses of some poets whom I could name never go beyond the city gates. Angered by this insolence, the prince accused the poet of confessing to blasphemy in the following line, if being a Muslim is that which Hafez holds, woe if there is a tomorrow after today. 
Hafez reports Brown went in great perturbation to Molana uh, Zainuddin Abu Bakr Taibadi, who happened to be uh, in Shiraz, and asked his advice. The latter recommended him to add another verse, placing the words to which exception was taken in uh, the mouth of another on the principle that reporting blasphemy is not blasphemy. Thereupon, Hafez prefixed the following verse to the one uh, cited. How pleasant to me seeing this saying which at early morn a Christian was reciting at the door of the tavern with tambourine and flute, if being a Muslim is uh, what Hafez holds. Go well, if there's a tomorrow. Well, yeah, yeah, as passing goes, well, bad, bad, bad. As far as I can say, Dabaghi's account is the only one that reports the destruction of Hafez's writing. I haven't been able to find it in any other. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, editions or uh, histories of uh, the poets, but it gives Shamlu a good excuse to s prove his points that. The most uh, rebellious verses have been deleted, and we're just dealing with a very, very, very safe uh, yeah. Hafez. Uh, and again, Shamlu is not alone in understandings of Erfan and poetry in a materialistic fact. That's why Mutahari feels that he should respond to him. So what he does, uh, in five lectures at the theology department in Tehran University, uh, he responds to these gentlemen, that is the intellectual, who fail to recognize that understanding someone like Hafez is possible only if you know the cultural Hafez. And to know the cultural Hafez, you should at least be familiar with Erfan as an Islamic science. So he's saying, we, the reason you think Hafez is not a Muslim is that you're bad Muslims, you don't know what Islam is. Uh, so, I'll jump, I told you how I'm going to <laughs> skip Motahari. I'll be more than happy to talk about him in uh, Q&A. So, uh, one of the most intriguing things that he does is to reject the idea that Hafez was a poet. And so if you look at this, uh, the biographies, uh, the biographers refer to him as a fati, juror, hakim, philosopher, teacher, adi, and not a poet. So he more strikingly implies that, not so subtly, Hafez was in fact a Shia through portraying him as a true artist. Says Shi'i Sufism has the advantage over Sunni Sufism that it delves deeper into matters intellectually and does not make a spectacle of rituals or masters. In this understanding, religion and mysticism are not competing regimes, but one and the same as constituted through poetry. So poetry for him becomes an Islamic science. Um, Mutahari accounts for the contradictions in Hafez's divan by attributing them to a universal secret whose meaning will be revealed when the, uh, with the advent of the hidden imam, and portrays Hafez as a genuine Shia precisely due to his recourse to the secret. In this reading, Shiism is marked by mystery, invisibility, and absence, which is most prominently shaped around the person of the 12th imam as the hidden imam. Due to the ambiguity of language and inherent polysemy that verges on contradiction, Hafez's ghazals become the best embodiment of the essence of Shiism, framed by the sixth Imam and popularized by Tabo Tabo'i and Mutahari. Uh, Shiism as a secret within a secret, a secret of something which remains hidden, a secret which may only be disclosed by another secret, a secret upon a secret which is supported by a secret. Mutahari's construction of a religious literary past for Islam, mysticism, Erfan, and Hafez allows him to refute the parallel discourses on the past that make claims on the present and future, especially Marxism. But more importantly, such reconstructions of religion and literature have specific political ramifications. In other words, it is those Shia scholars who read Hafez as a genuine Shia and his poetry as a testament to his access 
to the universal secret that also imagined the establishment of a political state that is deeply rooted in such an understanding of Shism, the advent of the 12th month. In its formative years, the doctrine of occultation in Shism relegated temporal rule to the profane sphere and postponed the establishment of a religious government to the end of time. While at times the inner worldliness of mystical Shism marked indifference towards worldly power in the 20th century and at the hands of Ayatollahs Khomeini and Mutahari, the inner worldliness transformed into a political attitude. Thank you. Thank you so much. For of course. For this. Sorry for. It's such a wonderful I'm sure you have seen these images. No rules at <laughs> offices. <laughs> We have a uh, very short time for a couple of questions. Uh, if uh, no questions. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, th thank you so much. It's such an important project, and you know I really uh, enjoyed it. Uh, and I have a lot of things I wanted to comment and ask about, but I probably should keep it short. Um, but one, uh, I guess I should say that one thing I I've been working on a long project on a text called Davistan and Maslow, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. which is a text that was known to early Orientalists. So you, your question, you had a question of, of what Palmer might have known that called Hafez yeah. a she, but there's a passage in Davistan um, in which. Uh, uh, th there's a, a Golat sect that's being described mm -hmm. of Noktavis. They, they say that uh, Hafez was Noktavi. Um, but, but I'll ask a, a sort of more general question, um, which in, uh, in, in India uh, during the 20th century, um, Marxist writers um, uh, sort of uh, engaged in a debate about form mm -hmm. of poetry. Um, that is, what form of poetry is most appropriate to convey um, sort of Marxist messages, and and the dis and, and the uh, the resolution of that debate within South Asia was that the ghazal is actually the, the appropriate form for expression of Marxism, and you have this sort of divide between so-called progressives and modernists who write in free verse. Why in Iran, you know, was it the case that uh, you know someone like Shamlu or something like that could write in? Free verse and 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 viewed mm -hmm. for, classical forms as, as being somehow antithetical to. Well, yeah, that that's something I'm trying to figure out. And actually, my first project was socialist Kazal right. of Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iran oh, and awesome. India. Okay. But uh, yeah. I didn't have all the languages, so a another retirement project. <laughs> cool. But but one very very maybe superficial response would be this influence of translation and self orientalization even may call it so Shafi Katani makes the claim that the only thing that happened in the late 19th and 20th century that affected Persian poetry was translation and uh, so right. all these authors are trying to imitate the Westerner right. and Hajir actually writes that Persian poetry is terrible Look at French literature, what they are doing. We have to do that. Right. They use Greek names, but they are reviving the French spirit. And he's not alone in those understandings. And, and again, with the constitutional revolution and these attempts to uh, uh, experiments with form, and again, many post Nima people accuse him of being still right. restrained by the form. He's not going beyond the meters. Uh, but yeah, and, but then on the other hand, we have someone like Shahriyar and Sayyid who are writing ghazals that are very, very popular. And Sayyid for me becomes very interesting because his ghazals are confused with those of Hafiz. So what's happening? And the other side of it is that while they are not using ghazal necessarily for their political aspirations, they're reading Hafiz for Dosi Khayyam as political poets. And again, this reading of the past into the present well into 1920s, they refer to Marxists as Mazdakis. Oh. They do not use Marxist or mm -hmm. Bolshevik or communists. It's a Mazdaki, Mazdaki, Mazdaki. So uh, Halaj was read as a socialist. But, but yes, when it comes to the new, they really want something new. And the old is really read in the political lens. So oh, you said that like they're kind of idolizing French poetry. Like, what's so good about French poetry? Ah, oh, that's <laughs> a good question. <laughs> the whole, like, I, mean, I don't want to like group them all together, but like, you look at like all the you know poetry in that region. Mm -hmm. Like, is like did they just resonate with like the French? ideas or what? No, again, I have a cliche. I tell my students 
the answer to questions are two, either colonialism or it is from Iran. So, <laughs> an Iranian answer for you. But in this case, we cannot imagine the power of Orientalism, the part on Zanon I read for you, Islam and science. The Muslims themselves are believing it, that we are inferior. Those who, are, who love Islam, actually Ayatollah Naimi makes the claim that the reason that Muslims are backward, this is what's happening in most of the colonized world. We are backward, we are backward, we have to follow Europe. We have to reach them. Uh, Ayatollah Naimi says the reason that the Europeans have made progress is that they have followed real Islam and we have not. So again, they accept that narrative of progress. And that's why they think that if they are imitating them, they will be able, and again, this is an age that national literature uh, is uh, gaining or has become an essentialist uh, thing for establishment of nationality. Again, nation state is a new concept. We have to create myths about why it has always been there. And French did it with their theater, with poetry, so on and so forth. And they've been very successful in making everyone accept yeah. that. This is Portuguese wonderful. Poetry is really good. No. It's good. <laughs> Another thing is that many of the intellectuals were trained in France. So they were sent by the government to study something in France and come back. And there can also be a Russian influence in the fact that aristocracy intelligentsia spoke French. And so, yes, I can go on and on. And on. Yeah, <laughs> it's chaotic, but that's good. Boils down to colonialism. Uh, the answer, yes, yes, colonialism. But even French poetry comes from yeah. Iran, if you ask a good Iranian. Yeah. Right. So on that first chaotic note, <laughs> uh, let me thank you again. <laughs> thank you.